Hello everybody and welcome to this second of our St Jude's online services. Uh, you might be surprised to see me out here. This is actually the backyard of the rectory. This, the, the sandstone behind me is the, is the rectory. Uh, and you might be surprised to see me not in the church. The reason is because as some of you have heard, one of our family members was sick during the week and uh, uh, flu-like sort of symptoms. Was it coronavirus? Well, it now seems unlikely, but uh, on the doctor's advice, knowing that we weren't going to qualify for a test for the virus, um, we, uh, we've isolated ourselves and I haven't been inside the church all week. So here we are outside the church um, and uh, that's where I'm speaking from today, but I'm very much looking forward to bringing you the service from inside the church next week. Um, and as well as that, really hoping that we can incorporate some of the organ music into the service next week. Um, but uh, this week we're finishing off our series in Matthew's Gospel in the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, I've been looking forward to this as well. It's actually our ninth week studying the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, nine weeks does seem an awfully long time ago now, doesn't it? Uh, on February the 2nd, when I preached the first of these uh, sermons, uh, it was at the Beatitudes on Vision Sunday, who could have imagined that by now we would be out of our church building and forced to be meeting across cyberspace? Who could have imagined that as I cast a vision to fill the church, the next thing that God would do would be to empty it? So it certainly has been an eventful nine weeks, uh, but I think that for us as we've listened to Jesus afresh in his Sermon on the Mount, it's been an enjoyable nine weeks. I've, I've felt a lot of positivity from you about these sermons, uh, partly I think because it's just so wonderful to sit with the disciples at Jesus' feet as he himself set out the manifesto of his kingdom, that the meek would inherit the earth, that his disciples were going to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth, that we should turn the other cheek, that we should go the extra mile, that we should love our enemies, store our treasure in heaven, that we can't serve two masters, that we shouldn't throw our pearls to swine, but that we certainly should ask, seek, and knock, because our Heavenly Father loves to give good things to his children. It's a thrill, isn't it, to hear those familiar and beautiful words, and to be so close to Jesus Christ himself as he announced his kingdom. Today's passage in Matthew chapter 7, uh, beginning at verse 13, is the conclusion to Jesus' speech, and it's similarly littered with those timeless phrases, the straight and narrow, the wolf in sheep's clothing, build your house on the rock. But the one thing we must not do is to be so caught in admiration for Jesus' words that we forget to put them into practice. For the central point he makes is that we are to hear his words and do them. And he wants us to realize that the stakes couldn't possibly be higher. I suppose you could say that in recent weeks, we've been in a battle as a, a community, uh, as a, I'm talking about the, the Australian community, uh, we've been in this battle to make people realize what high stakes we're playing with, with this pestilence that's afoot uh, in, in, in the land. Uh, that this really is a life and death situation, at least for those who are particularly vulnerable to this virus, uh, and that radical action has been necessary to prevent its spread. Jesus is in the same sort of battle to make people realise the stakes they are playing with when it comes to eternity. Jesus' advice to enter by the narrow gate, verse 13, and travel by the narrow way. Now, on the surface, it seems to resonate with some of those individualistic slogans that we hear these days, take the road less traveled, go your own way, things like that. But what those sloganeers have in mind is that, well, yeah, look, you should think for yourself and not complacently go along with the crowd. And, and who knows, through exercising some independent thought, we might find that we 
we find ourselves in a holiday destination or discover an investment opportunity that other people have not thought of. But for Jesus, the stakes of taking the narrow way are much higher than that. For Jesus, when he says to take the narrow gate, to take the, the narrow path, it's because the road to destruction, he's talking about eternal destruction, the road to destruction is wide, and many people take it, whereas the path to life is narrow, and few people find it. It's a classic case of things not being as they seem. If you see a road with plenty of people travelling on it, you assume that they're going the right way and that they are relatively safe. They can't all be wrong, surely. Jesus' warning is, they can all be wrong. Broad is the road that leads to destruction. When it comes to my spiritual life, I should not simply go along with the crowd. There is no safety in numbers when it comes to my spiritual life. Enter through the narrow gate, Jesus says. In another place in John's Gospel, Jesus calls himself the gate. I am the gate for the sheep. Whoever enters through me will be saved. Now that's great comfort, isn't it? That is, that's certainty. Whoever enters through me will be saved. But Jesus is the narrow gate. So we shouldn't expect that to follow him will be mainstream. And that's why we're to watch out for false prophets. Verse 15, they come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. A prophet is someone who brings a message from God. A false prophet is someone who brings a message that they say is from God but who in fact has not been sent by God and whose words are not from God. Jesus' warning again here is that things are not always as they seem. The false prophets, they come in disguise. I mean, I suppose what else would we, be, would, would, would we expect? Would we expect the false prophets to come openly with a name tag on them that says, false prophet, hello, I'll be the one to mislead you today. No, of course, that would be pretty pointless, wouldn't it? Who would follow someone who was dressed as a false prophet? So they come in disguise. They might look the part. They might sound the part. They might be nice and caring. Yet all the while, they are conducting people down the road to destruction. So how do we tell a false prophet from a true? Well, Jesus' point, of course, is it's not by appearance. It's not by what's on the surface. Jesus says, by their fruit, you will recognize them. My friend Dave, who does the gardens around here at St. Jude's, has an amazing knowledge of plants. You point to a plant and he has named it by genus and species before you can say Araucaria heterophylla. But for the rest of us, without such amazing botanical knowledge, the test for working out a tree is, well, this only works for fruit trees, but you, you wait a while, maybe a whole year, maybe even more, and see what it produces. If it produces oranges, it's an orange tree. If it produces peaches, it's a peach tree. Now, this method takes a lot of patience, but by their fruit, you will know them. So what does Jesus' fruit metaphor stand for here? What is Jesus asking us to look at in the lives of the prophets, in the, in the products of these uh, prophets, people who want to teach us about God, that, that's going to help us to know whether they are legitimate or not? Well, it's interesting that earlier on in Matthew's Gospel, we heard John the Baptist say, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Uh, I think that the fruit that should be seen in the life of the prophet is the fruit of repentance. 
Has this person repented of their sins? Are they traveling the narrow path? Are they urging their hearers to repent of their sins and to travel the narrow path? These are the sorts of tests that we need to apply as we decide which Christian leader that we're going to follow. Now, we shouldn't expect to find a heretic under every stone. We don't want to be uh, sort of at a point where we're overly critical and, and, and picky and looking to call everybody into some sort of false teacher. That's not Jesus' intention at all here. Jesus simply asks us to be on the lookout. He asks us to care enough about Jesus himself and about keeping to the narrow path that we don't uncritically believe everything that anyone might try to teach us in the name of God. Because as he says there in verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Words are important, but words can be cheap, can't they? Words can be easy to say. It's easy to call Jesus Lord. What Jesus is inviting us, urging us, commanding us to do is more difficult than that. It's to do the will of his Father in heaven. And then the other touchstone that Jesus gives in verse 23 is to be people that Jesus knows. The ones that he casts away, he says, he will say to them, I never knew you. What he wants us to be are people whom he knows, who are friends of Jesus. I think if he is to say that he knows us, well, he, he's going to have to have heard us speak to him in prayer, isn't he? I, I really think this idea of friendship with Jesus, of knowing Jesus, it's expressed above all in that, in that prayer relationship where we're able to speak to our Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus, his Son, and it's a familiar relationship where through years of relationship, we, we've been expressing that friendship with God. Do you see how this underscores the warnings that Jesus gives about the false prophets? There are people who are getting around. There, there are people out there at the moment. It, it was in the case in Jesus' day. It's the case in our day as well. There are people getting around there out in the world who are calling Jesus Lord, who are not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now that is sobering, isn't it? And it means that if someone claims to speak to us on behalf of God, we need to look beyond their appearance, we need to look beyond their position, the, the, the mere words that they use, to whether they are actually doing the will of Jesus' Father in heaven whether they are proclaiming his full message, calling for repentance, showing repentance in their own life, being a person of prayer who knows God, and traveling and leading people along the narrow path to life. Personally, I think that verses 21 to 23 are mainly there to underline the danger of false teachers. I don't think they're there to make to make you worry or to make me worry. Oh, what if I'm one of the people who, who calls Jesus Lord but isn't going to enter the kingdom of heaven? No, I don't think Jesus wants to make us unnecessarily doubt our, our own faith like that or, or sort of get in a panic. Oh, is there something wrong with my faith that means I'm not going to inherit the kingdom of heaven? No, I don't think Jesus is trying to do that. And the reason is because he gives us strong comfort at the end. Verse 24, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. What we're called to do here is to hear Jesus' words 
and to put them into practice. Did you notice those words there? To put them into practice. Not just to admire the words, no, no matter how beautiful the Sermon on the Mount is, and it certainly is, but not just to admire Jesus' words, but to obey the summons to turn from sin and enter the kingdom of God. To be one of Jesus' disciples. You see, if you're an admirer of Jesus, then when he says, love your enemies, you can, you can say, well, look, that is a lovely ideal, and I might try it from time to time. But if you're a disciple, then love your enemies is a command from the Lord. Just like don't take revenge. Don't cherish lustful thoughts in your heart. Don't judge. If we're a disciple, then Jesus' words are to be put into practice as words from our Saviour and Lord, as, as commands. Now, that certainly is difficult. But if we do put his words into practice, then he guarantees our security in the judgment that's to come. The storm that Jesus speaks about, which the house had to weather, it's the storm of the final judgment, the test of how we've built our life. But the man who had heard Jesus' words and put them into practice had nothing to fear. His house was secure, built on a rock. Now, as good Protestants, we might have questions about how these teachings relate to God's free gift of salvation through the atoning death of Jesus on the cross. Uh, we, we learn, in, we're, we're very familiar and have been well taught that Jesus' salvation that he has won for us is a gift. It does not depend on our deeds. Uh, and yet Jesus' emphasis here does very much seem to be on our deeds. So, so how does that fit together? You know, that's a very important question for us to ask. I think we ought to see here that Jesus' picture of the house weathering the storm in complete security. This is, this is a great picture of comfort from God. This is a promise of God's protection. If it depended on my deeds, it wouldn't be any comfort because I'd always be wondering whether my deeds were good enough to constitute the that rock. In actual fact, the promise of security that Jesus gives depends on his atoning death. So the man who built his house on the rock was secure, not because his deeds reached a certain standard, but because he heard the powerful words of Jesus and put them into practice. Jesus' words are where the power lies. But as disciples, we have to remember that these words are to be put into practice. At the start of Tolkien's famous novel, The Lord of the Rings, the wizard Gandalf is trying to persuade the little hobbit Bilbo to give up his magic ring and leave it behind him as he departs for another home. Bilbo really doesn't want to give up the ring. But eventually Gandalf persuades him that he ought to give it up. It's the right thing to do. And so Bilbo agrees. Yes, you're right, Gandalf. I should give up the ring. And so Bilbo turns to the door to leave the house. In which Gandalf says, Bilbo, you've still got the ring in your pocket. He'd agreed that he should give up the ring. Gandalf's words were right. But to put them into practice was, was another step. And it's always the hardest step, isn't it? To do, actually to do it. Jesus' beautiful words in the Sermon on the Mount are to be put into practice as commands of the Master, not as mere advice. Jesus says in John's Gospel, my words are spirit and life. 
Entering the narrow gate means receiving Jesus' words and putting them into practice as commands from our Saviour and Lord, as words which are spirit and life. Now, of course, we're going to fail along the way. And there is forgiveness for that because our security is in Jesus, not in our deeds. But let's accept the challenge today that Jesus' life-giving words are to be put into practice. Shall we pray together? Our gracious Heavenly Father, you are so good to us to have sent your Son into the world, announcing the kingdom of heaven, uh, inviting us onto the narrow path which leads to life, to eternal life, and blessings at your right hand side forever. Heavenly Father, please uh, help us today uh, to accept this, uh, this simple but profound teaching from Jesus, that his words are indeed to be put into practice. Father, please save us from, from the mistake of being admirers of Jesus' words, uh, but not those who do them. Uh, please help us to accept uh, these precious words of your Son as words to be put into practice as commands from our Saviour and Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen.